We're in our series uh, in the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. So if you'd like to, you can turn to Exodus chapter 20, and uh, we're in verse 12. It's just that one verse that we'll be looking at today. It's a one-verse commandment. Um, so if you don't go there, it's not the biggest deal in the world either. It's, it reads like this. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. Honor your father and your mother. That's the commandment, the fifth commandment that we'll be talking about, that we'll be discussing this morning. But before I begin, before we jump into it, I want to do a little thing. I want to get us all to close our eyes. I'm going to do it too. Just close your eyes with me. <clears throat> and I want you to just calm um, your heart and your mind for a moment. And I want you to picture the face of your father. Picture the face of your father. And now use three words to describe your father. And now picture the face of your mother. Picture her face. And use three words to describe your mother. And just open your eyes again. Now, for some of us, we, we pictured some very fond expressions on their face, didn't we? They had a grin or they had a smile and perhaps we went further and we pictured how dad used to bounce us on his knee or something like that. And it's quite a fond, fond memory for us, wasn't it? But then others of us pictured maybe an angry face, perhaps no face, perhaps um, a resentful face. And when we tried to think of the three words, some of us had good things to say. Dad, mum were there for me, they cared for me, he was honourable or she was caring, he was um, a man of respect and she was a woman of integrity. We had good words to say. But then some of us did not have anything good to say at all. We had other words in mind, like he was a nobody to me, or she didn't care. And so as we come to this commandment, I wanted us to do that because I hope that um, just helps us recognize the complexity of the command that we're about to deal with, to honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment that deals directly with our relationship to other people. So the first four commandments, they are more explicitly targeted at our relationship to God. Now we're experiencing a shift in the Ten Commandments to how we relate to others. And this is the first commandment, and it targets the family, honor your father and your mother. So this is a complicated command. It's a complicated situation, but still, the Lord doesn't give any exception clauses, no ifs, no buts in this commandment. Honor your father and your mother that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. No exceptions, no ifs, no buts. It's a welcome engagement for some of us because we're like, that's good. I'll, yes, I should honor my mother, my father. They did so much for me when I was younger, so tell me how and this will be good. Let's, let's get on with it. Fathers, it's going to be a bit of a painful uh, sore to honor my mother and my father. I don't know. But the reason there's so much emotion involved, the reason it's so painful or it's so joyous, either or, the reason for that is because it's so important. It's just such an important command. It's such an important relationship. It's the first one that the Lord touches on in terms of how we would relate to others. And so it bears our careful attention and our prayerful um, consideration on how to actually act this commandment out. Because it takes wisdom. It really does. But my prayer this morning, and, and I hope what we get to at the end, is that we would see that the Lord's ways are higher than our ways, and that we can say along with Paul, Oh, the depths of the riches of the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how unscrutable are his ways. And then as a little child who loves their parent, that we would obey this commandment. Because as Jesus said, is, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So I pray that we would humbly recognize that and, and be able to step forward into this commandment that the Lord has for us. So let's dive in together. 
the commandment. Honour your father and mother. What does it mean to honour your father and your mother? The word honour in Hebrew is kabed, and it means to be weighty, to give weight to. Something is heavy. And so the idea to honour your father and your mother is that you would give them their due weight. There's weight that they have that you don't. Think of this, I think of this as um, when I'm around the dinner table with my daughter Holly, she's getting to the age where she wants to, you know, give her a little opinion, uh, which is fine. She gives her opinion. She says, Dad, I don't really want to eat the vegetables because, you know, they're not as tasty as the ice cream that's coming afterwards, so I'm not going to eat that. I'm going to wait for the ice cream. And I say, that's lovely little opinion you've got there, Holly, but <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, but my opinion is that you will eat your vegetables because they're good for you. But it's not just an opinion versus an opinion, is it? Mine is couched in God-given authority. Mine has weight to it. And so for Holly to honor her father in that situation would be to recognize that I have a God-given weight, authority, to what I'm saying, and so she ought then to obey her father and so honor her father in that moment. To honor means not just to obey, it means to esteem, it means to respect, to regard, to hold up, all of these things that play into this idea of giving them weight. That's what you owe because of who you are. And it's God that actually decided who they were. What I mean is, God has sovereignly chosen that your parents are your parents. As in, I could not be and will never be your parent. I have my children, my wife and I have our children, and that's, that's it. And the Lord's done that for each and every one of us. And that can hurt, even just that, saying that, because, you know, we, there's a complicated life that we live in, isn't it? Because some of us don't know our father, some of us don't know our mother, and yet you're telling me that God picked them to be mine. That's, that's how God's done it. They're your father, they're your mother. It opens up a can of worms. We'll get there in a moment, but I want you to trust me because we're gonna progress through this. It might hurt. Just come with me together and let's see what the Lord would have to say um, for us. That's where we looked at what honor is, but now I wanna talk about why God chose the word honor because it plays into this entire idea that I was talking about. Why honor? Because life is not as, um, as simple as parents are always good, right? So why didn't he choose the word trust, trust your parents, or obey your mother and father, or love your father and mother? Why didn't God choose all of those words instead? Because they're all good things to do, and in fact, they're needed in the right situation. But let's take them one at a time. He didn't choose the word trust because sometimes it's actually not good for us to trust our parents if they've proven to again and again and again betray our trust. And so it's not fitting for an entire lifespan situation. Not every circumstance is accounted for if he chose to use the word trust. Likewise, if he chose to use the word obey, because elsewhere the Bible does say obey, like in Ephesians 6.1, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So that's a right thing, but why didn't he use it here? Because eventually children will grow up, won't they? We will grow up, all of us. I'm not looking at, don't think there's any child in the room except for little Henley at the back. She's probably not gonna hear this commandment just yet. But, you know, we're, we're, we're grown up, okay? And so we're independent. And there's a place and a time for us to no longer be obedient in the strict sense of what it was like for us as a child. So God didn't use the word obey here in this command. He used the word honor. Now, think back to the trust example. We can still honor our parents, without trusting them. How do we do that? Let's say, for example, um, our, our father keeps lying to us and instead of just getting aggravated and angry and thinking that he owes us something in that moment, we can actually honor him by lovingly continuing the relationship and suffering the loss, suffering what it means to bear with him and then move on and continue on and hopefully we pray that that would be a witness to him and he might come to know the Lord. Or how about obey? Um, because when it comes time for us to no longer strictly be obedient to our parents, how can we still honor them? Well, it looks a bit like this. You know, you're grown up, you're moving out, you're going to pick a house, and you look at the house, and, and your parent says, yep, you should build it this way and paint it blue. And you think, hmm, maybe not. 
I'm going to paint it white, if, if you don't mind. But thanks for reminding me to you know, choose the weatherproof paint, OK? In that way, you can still accept their opinion. You can still um, ask them for their wisdom. And so honor them in that way. But you don't need to be strictly obedient to your parents now that you've grown older. And so God didn't use the word obey either. But what about love? Why didn't he use the word love? Love your mother and your father. And I think the reason that he didn't use this, because it is the most important thing, isn't it? The whole law is summed up with the words, honor, uh, love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. So why didn't he use the word love? And I think the reason is because he wanted to be more specific with your parents. He wanted to be more specific with the way in which you love your mother and your father. You honor them. It's different to the way you love your neighbor, your next door neighbor. It's different to the way you love your, um, your best friend, your colleague. You don't love them in the same way as your father and mother in that they don't have the authority given by God to speak into your life in a way in which should impact you. They don't have the same authority given to them. And so God says, honor your father and your mother. This is the word that he's chosen. This is what we need to think about. We need to give weight, no matter what it looks like, no matter what time, as in age-wise, we're in, we still honor our father and our mother. A good way to um, illustrate this example, I think, is by looking at the life of Jesus. And when he was uh, a young boy, he was 12 years old, he went to the um, temple because his parents were celebrating the Passover feast. But on the way home, they found out that Jesus wasn't among them in the, um, in the, in the caravan that was heading back to Nazareth. So they start freaking out and they're like, where's Jesus? Where's he gone? So they run back to Jerusalem and then they find him there three days later and he's sitting down just instructing and asking questions and giving answers to the teachers of the law and his parents are amazed but then they're also just like what have you done to us you've like we're panicking here we've missed you for three days and Jesus says why were you looking for me didn't you know that I should be in my father's house and at that moment Mary nor Joseph really understood what Jesus was was doing they're like what do you what do you mean by that they didn't quite get it, so Mary had to leave it in her heart later to think about. But a little side point that I want to make there is that sometimes us as parents need to recognize that we don't understand where our children are coming from, and likewise, children need to understand that our parents don't exactly always see what we're trying to be on about. Um, yet, this text tells us that Jesus went with them to Nazareth and was submissive to them. At 12 years old, Jesus submitted himself to earthly parents, and he obeyed them. And that's what honoring his father and his mother looked like at the age of 12. And this is like crazy because Jesus is a sinless son of God. He has all authority if he wanted to claim it in a moment, and yet he's submitting himself to his earthly father and his earthly mother. Later on in his life, Jesus is now about 30 years old. So, you know, he's quite the adult. He's begun his ministry and he's at a wedding in Cana, and um, his, his mother says, the wine has run out at the wedding, and he's, she's coming up to Jesus, and she's implying, Jesus, you know what to do about this. You have something, you, you're special. You can do something about this matter. They're about to run out of wine at a wedding. It's going to be dramatic. And Jesus says, it's not my time yet. It's not my time. And then Mary says to the servants, do as what Jesus says. Do what Jesus says. She doesn't say, obey me. She doesn't say, can you just do it or whatever because she no longer has the right to command Jesus as though he was a boy anymore. Now the relationship is looking like respect because Jesus does actually end up turning the water into wine, doesn't he? He respects his mother and so honors her in that way. Given who she is, he still, even though it wasn't his time yet, turned that water into wine and he respected, he honored his mother. And then skip forward three more years. Jesus is now on the cross. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being crucified for the sins of the world, is on the cross. He's in agony not just because of the sin that he's bearing, but also because of the pain of crucifixion. He's being asphyxiated. It means like he's suffocating. But then he looks down and he sees his mother Mary 
And she's right there next to the Apostle John, his best friend. And instead of, you know, thinking about himself or, you know, he's in a lot of pain, he had every right to think about what's happening to him, he looks at uh, his mother and he says, woman, behold your son. And he looks at John and he says, behold your mother. And from that moment on, John took Mary into his own home to care for her, to look after her, And that was a big thing in that day and age because without Joseph and now without Jesus, Mary would have not had a a, a good way to have just physical needs met, roof over her head, provision and all those things. Even in Jesus' death, he's finding a way to honour his mother and that's what it looked like. Do you see how it moved? From childhood, he was obedient. He always respected his mother and then it looked like care toward the end of his age. All the way through, it's still honoring your father and your mother. So it looks different as we grow older, but we're still doing the same command. And that's what the Lord is asking of us in this command, to honor our father and our mother. And unlike Jesus, we actually sin against our parents. But Jesus, he never sinned against his parents. And he still submitted, he still obeyed, he still honored, he still cared for them. He did all of those things. But this brings us to some complications now, doesn't it? If that's what it means, and if that's what it looks like, and if Jesus has given us that example, what about us who have had unhonorable parents, dishonorable parents? How can we honor our dishonorable parents? Because after all, you don't know what I've been through. That's That's the objection, isn't it? You don't know what I've been through, Ben. You don't know how my father used to beat my mother and what he did to me and what he's still doing to me. How can I honor him? You don't know how my mother ran off with another man and left me as a teenage girl to look after my three younger siblings because dad was in a wheelchair and she couldn't handle it. How can I honor my mother? That's the complicated situation that we face. And so I don't want to belittle that in any way for us one bit, not one bit. And it's tragic that this is a reality and it's becoming more and more so in our day and age. And no, I don't know what you've been through. I don't. But God does. God knows exactly what you've been through. And even as a little child, if you were pouring your heart out into you didn't even know what, maybe you had some little faith and you just knew that there was a God because children do that, they know, and they just call out and they pray. That's probably what you did. Well, God has counted every single one of those prayers. He records them in his book. And every single tear that has rolled down your face as a child, God's collected them in his bottle. He remembers, he knows exactly what you've been through. But still in his wisdom and in his grace, he didn't provide an escape clause for us in this commandment for those who have dishonorable parents. And so if this is what you're struggling with this morning, the first and the best thing that you need to do to honor your father and your mother is to forgive them. It's actually to forgive them for what they've done. Because so long as you hold on to that root of bitterness in your heart, there's no progression. There's going to be no healing. You're not going to be able to start that, that stage of healing while there's still bitterness lying in your heart. You're going to need to forgive your father and your mother or your mother. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 to 32 says, Let all bitterness... Let the bitterness and the wrath and the anger and the clamor and slander be put away from you. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And that's, that's the key. When we remember how much God has forgiven us in Christ, and when we take our heartfelt pain to him, 
He will give us the strength needed. He will supply the love needed for us to be able to forgive our mother and our father. So you can, you can do that right now. You can do that at the end of the day. I would say ASAP is the, best, is the best way to go about it, to pray and ask for forgiveness for your mother and your father. And then you'll experience the healing grace of God come and flood into your heart. But forgiving doesn't mean that we're going to excuse their behavior, does it? It doesn't mean that we're condoning it. It doesn't mean we're saying what they did didn't hurt. It's not saying that what they did wasn't wrong. What it is saying is you're no longer going to require the debt that they owe you from them. You're absorbing the damage. Hear me clearly. You are, there's damage, but you're absorbing it. You're letting it go. You're giving justice to God, and you're saying, God, what they did was wrong, but I'm leaving it to you because you're the just judge. And a good picture, a good way to understand that is in Romans 12. I'll read it at length. It says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I read that at length because that doesn't just apply to our forgiveness of our father and our mother, does it? That applies to our entire Christian life. This is a mark of a Christian to not repay evil with evil, to do good to those who'd hurt you, bless those who curse you. It's just the flip reversal. That's what Jesus taught us. That's what we need to practice. This is a a moment to practice what we actually believe, that if this is what Christ has done for us, then we ought to forgive, to not hold on to grudges and to let it go, to give it over to God who judges justly. Remember that God actually cares about justice more than you. Do you know that? He cares that you got hurt more than you actually care that you got hurt. It grieves him more. And that's why in this verse he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. In other words, don't take it into your hands, don't worry about it, vengeance is mine, believe me, I've got this. I care about justice because this assault It has hurt me. I'm the creator who loves all of my creation and this assault has hurt me more than it's hurt you. Such is my love for you. Such is my justice. I will repay. And this day we know is coming when Jesus Christ comes back the second time for his church, for his bride, and we experience the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to see the Lord deal out justice and it will come. We hand it over to him and we trust in him because he cares for us and loves us and cares about justice more than us. But this isn't the end of the complexities, is it? Because there's not just uh, those of us here who have experienced um, hurt and hardship with their father and their mother, but we also, um, there's some of us who have never even met our father or or our mother. Or we've gone from home to home, foster parents and step parents, and who's our real dad anyway? There's complications all over the place. Some of our parents have passed away. We've lost them. How do I honor them now? Complications everywhere. So again, I pray you forgive me if I can't address every little thing. Instead, what I want to do is give us a bit of uh, comfort and to reorientate our thinking along these lines, which is that God, instead of um, just leaving us alone, he's given us a spiritual family. He's given us his family. He's adopted us as a father. It says in Psalm 27, 10, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will let me in. He's adopted us as sons, those who have repented of their sins and trusted alone in Jesus Christ. You are a son, a daughter of God, and he is your father now. He's your father, and unlike any earthly father who falls and fails, I'm one, I fail, I fall, some worse than others, some better, but God is perfect, 
And he will never leave you nor forsake you. He's the perfect father. And he's given himself to you through Jesus Christ. But more than that, he's also given us an entire family. Because he didn't just adopt us. He didn't just redeem us. He's redeemed everyone in Christ. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, a younger man as a brother, an older woman as a mother, and a younger woman as a sister. What he's saying is that regard your church family, those in Christ, as your spiritual fathers, mothers, daughters, brothers. Because that's the actual reality that we have in Christ Jesus, a new spiritual family. And so if you know an older man in the church, an older woman in the church, you can go up to them, you can invite your uh, you can invite them into your life, open up your home and let them in, welcome them in so that in practicality, we are living out the spiritual reality because we can say this as much as we want. You know, they're my spiritual brother. Hey, brother, hey, mother, father. But if we're not actually opening up our homes, if we're not doing life together, then practicality is going to just tell us, you know, we're not really acting as though that's the truth. So open up, open up your life, open up your home, ask for wisdom from older people in the congregation. Honor them as a father and as a mother. Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians that to the church, he's saying, I became your father through Christ Jesus in the gospel. What does he mean by this? He says, he's saying, because I was the one that preached the gospel to you, Christians in Corinth, and you accepted the, the message through my proclamation, you actually became like spiritual children to me. I'm like your father. I care for you. You are outside of Christ, now you're in, and you're really immature in the sense that you're new in the faith. You need to be brought up and discipled, and that's going to be my role because I'm your spiritual father. I led you to the Lord, I'm going to keep you going. And that is a reminder to us, if we've led someone to the Lord, we shouldn't just leave them there. They're like a baby. They're going to need milk, they're going to need milk of the word, as in teach them how to open the scriptures, teach them how to pray. They're going to need discipleship, they're going to need so much. And also, if you have been led to the Lord by someone in the congregation or even outside and you're able to be in contact with them still, call them up and ask them to continue the discipleship process because we were not saved to just be justified and that's it. We're in the family of God, no more moving. No, it's like children. They need to be grown up into the likeness of who? In our instance, it's God. Christ Jesus. That's what we need to be doing now that we're saved, growing up into his image. And the community is going to be God's blessing to you to be able to do that, to walk alongside one another, hold each other's hands, lift each, other's up, each, each other up when we fall down. God's given us a massive blessing in the spiritual family. But here's some practical reasons and, and tips or whatever suggestions you want to take them uh, that we can use as well to honor our father and our mother. We can honor them by seeking their wisdom on issues that we're less experienced in. So take, for example, marriage. You might be getting married and you're looking at your current um, uh, fiance and you're thinking, are they really the one for me or did I just fall head over heels in love? Um, is this a wise decision? Go to your parents and they will say, well, look, I made this you know, big blunder and then the Lord had to rebuke me here and he showed me this way and now I'm married to your mother and it's beautiful and lovely. Whatever, they can offer advice. They've been there before. They've done it, so go to them and learn from them so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that your father and your mother did. The same is true with buying a house or buying a car or which job to go to. They have a lot of wisdom. Take advantage of it. And that way we actually honor them. We honor them by saying, you know more, pass it on. It's a beautiful thing. We can also honor them by speaking well of our parents. This is a hard one for those of us who do have parents who don't really have, we don't have much to say about them. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to not say anything at all then. Don't say anything at all if it's not worth saying in regards to your parents because it's important that we honor our father and our mother and to just throw them down in the dirt isn't actually going to be helpful for you or for your listeners because it's going to teach them to not honor their father and their mother as well. But I would say that if you're in a relationship, you're married, for example, and you need to 
uh, tell your wife or um, uh, what, your story. You need to tell them your story. That would be a, an applicable situation to be able to share with them the hurt that you went through so that your wife understands what you're going through when you go through certain trials and struggles. You know, wisdom. We need wisdom about it. Same with your children. You might want to pass on to them, you know, my father did this and he passed it on to me and so if you ever see me do that, I'm sorry, I'm working it out. It's in the family lineage. We want to be redeemed. So, you know, these are good ways to be able to speak about the, the bad stuff. We need wisdom. That's what I'm saying. We need wisdom. But just don't, don't just rail them down. That's not good. And another way that we can honor them is to pray. Pray for them. If your parents, for example, are not Christians, what a wonderful opportunity to honor your father and your mother by praying for them and sharing the gospel to them. They need redemption. They need salvation in Christ. So honor them by sharing with them how you came to know the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that'll just open up a floodgate of possibilities that the Lord might use to bring your father and your mother to know him and save them. You can honor your father and your mother by giving them credit for the things that they've taught you. Thanks for teaching me how to handle my money. I would be in a big pile of trouble if you didn't. Thanks for teaching me how to garden. Because now I have a beautiful garden in my backyard. I would have never known how to do that if it wasn't for you. And I can enjoy it and show my kids just the beautiful wonders of a plant and how it grows. And I can teach them these lovely things. Thanks. That's not much. It doesn't seem like much. But that honors your father and your mother. They, they have this desire to want to see themselves in you. Every father and mother has that. I have that with my daughters. I want to be able to look at Holly and I want to be able to say, she's learnt something from me. She's taken some of my characteristics and is applying them to her life. That's a blessing to me. It honors me. It makes me glad. It really does. Find a way to honor your father and your mother. You can do even more practical things like paint their walls. You can trim their hedges. You can clean their gutters. As they get older and older, they're going to be less and less dependent independent, I should say, and this gives you room to come and do the very things that they did for you as a little child for them. It's like Jesus when he moved from the obedience to the caring. Who did the caring for Jesus when he was very young? Mary, Joseph. Who did the caring for Mary when she was older? Jesus. Roles are starting to reverse, and the same thing happens. Never do we lose the respect that we have, the weight that they owe, but we can start caring for our mother and our father. Don't leave it up to um, a specialist, don't leave it up to the, to the carers in a nursing home. Don't just leave it with them and say, hey, mum and dad are good, that'll be right. No, there is no one like you for them. You're their daughter, you're their son, you are special to them in, this way, in, in, in a way in which the carer never will be. And the same is true, what I'm saying um, in all of these things, the same thing is true with our spiritual family. You can apply all of these very same things to the older people in this congregation, those who are your spiritual fathers, your spiritual mothers. You can apply all of this. And so fulfill this command to honor your father and your mother that the Lord our God gives us. And this isn't a backup plan either. Like, oh, I don't have a real mum and dad, so I can go and do it in the church. It's not a backup plan. God makes it clear that our spiritual family is actually our our real family. It's our real one. That's the real one. And he makes this clear in Matthew chapter 12 where uh, Mary and Jesus' brothers are outside of the house. They're trying to get in. Jesus is teaching and the implication being that they're sort of using the fact that they're mother and brother to get into the house so they can see Jesus. And Jesus says, who is my mother? And who is my brother? Who really is? That's the question he's asking. And then he raises his hand, points to his disciples, and he says, these are my brothers, these are my mothers. And then he makes it explicit by saying, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus makes it clear that it's not those who are of physical relation who are first and foremost your brothers and your sisters. It's actually your spiritual family. It's not a backstage plan B it's not second rate, it's actually the real thing. Now, that doesn't mean that we neglect then the real physical family because again, God has made 
you to be in that physical family for a reason. And actually in uh, Paul's letters, he writes that if anyone doesn't care for the members of his own household, then he's denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. It's pretty harsh, right? So we don't neglect them. And if by God's grace that our physical family and our spiritual family are the same, praise God. Praise God. It's a wonderful thing. And um, that leads me then to the next practical point, the last practical way that we can honour God uh, that I want to talk about. And that is we can honour God, uh, honour our father and our mother, sorry, by being good parents, by being the parents that we never had or by being better parents than our good parents. You know, I want Holly to grow up to be a better mum than I was a father. That's honouring to me. It's not like, oh, you stole my thunder. No, that's honoring to me because if she's a, an honorable mother, then I, in a sense, get to go, great, I taught her well, and this glorifies God ultimately. God gets the glory. It's not about me. It's about God. It's the same in our spiritual family. I hope that all of you grow to be more mature than me in the faith. I really do because why? God gets the glory, not me. It's not about me being like, oh, I'm this or that. I want us to all be mature in Christ, to measure up to the fullness of the stature of Christ, as it says in Ephesians. That's what I want because it glorifies God. And it's the same way in our parenting. If we actually had the charge to, I want my children to be even better followers of Jesus Christ, then what a charge to pick up and what a charge to follow on and what a charge to to continue to work at with whatever stage relationship you are with your children or, or so forth. And the thing is, in this day and age, we're actually going to find quite the opposition to that ideal. We're, going, we're, we're hitting hard um, cultural tides at the moment, and I'm thinking particularly of the sexual revolution that's sweeping the West. The idea, it's backed up in Freudian psychology that, you know, sex actually defines who you are. So to not fulfill your sexual desires actually means that you're not living your true self. You're not actually being who you are. That's what's pervading our culture. We're going to need to be ready to deal with that. We're going to need to be aware of these arguments. We're going to need to be aware of where they're coming from so that we can deal with it properly and actually bring our children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, not in the discipline and instruction of the world. We're going to need to be wary of it. Same with radical feminism, or let's take it in the church, apostasy that's happening in the church. We're going to have to be aware of all these things, warn our children against them. Otherwise, they will just go off in their own way, not have direction, and we shouldn't be surprised if they then get lost or if they end up hating on the church or end up in social troubles, who knows? Where it's all gonna go right and wrong for a child, for those of us who are gonna be parents, is in the home with the children. They're watching us, they're watching our every move. I wanna give us two practical ways that can help us be good parents for our children. And this is different for the 9 a.m., there's a lot of families but I'm looking here, it's still applicable for the stages of life that we're in today. And then there's some of us who are gonna be parents or looking to be parents as well. So I hope this um, is still very useful for us and that we remember these things. The first way that I wanna give us a practical tip, lesson, that we can be good parents and teach our children to honor our father and our mother is actually to give them the best example possible And why I say that is because children are like sponges. They just soak up everything they see. And if they see you not honoring your father and your mother, then they're not going to listen to you when you just repeat Ephesians 6, 1 at them, Ephesians 6, 2 and 3, which says, honor your father and your mother. Or this commandment, Exodus 20, verse 12, that says, honor your father and your mother. You can say that till you're blue in the face and your kids are just not going to listen because they're looking at you and they're saying, you don't obey your own commands. Why would I do that? And then they won't honor you either. It's so important to set a good example for your children. And where this is really going to drive home is for us in the, in the home with mum and dad, with husband and wife. Because that is who they look up to the most. That is who they watch the most. And what I mean is this. I'm going to talk to you husbands at the moment or husbands-to-be. 
if you don't honor your wife by loving her as Christ even loved the church and gave himself up for her and went down, humbled himself in order to serve her needs, if you don't do that and instead you're oppressive and you just don't regard her efforts, you don't hold her opinion as anything worth listening to, then the children are going to see that and they're going to say, Dad doesn't honor mum, so why should I honor mum? And so next time when mum starts to tell the children what to do, go clean your room or whatever, no. Why? Because they saw dad disrespect mum. They saw dad not honor mum. So why should I honor mum? It's terribly important that we set a good example. The same thing can be said for us wives, for those of us who are wives or wives to be. If you don't honor your husband and submit to him as to the Lord, then don't be surprised when your ch children don't honor your father. If you're backbiting at him, you're always complaining about how he's lazy and he doesn't take responsibility. He always comes home and he's just tired and he never plays with the kids and you just, you know, these things aren't great, but you're just always wailing on him. You're never lifting him up and, and helping him to realize his God-given role to lead. You're always slamming him down and the children see that and then all they're going to do is copy mom and slam dad and not honor him. So we need to set a good example for our children so that they can see what it means to honor their father and mother by copying what mom and dad do with each other. It begins there. It really does. The Bible says you'll reap what you sow. If you sow dishonor, you're going to reap dishonor with your children. The second way that I think is helpful for us to think about in terms of parenting our children is that they must be instructed, disciplined, and corrected. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, it says, My son, hear your father, father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Folly is actually bound up in their heart. The rod of discipline drives it far from them. Proverbs 3, 11 to 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his correction. For the Lord corrects him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Parents, parents-to-be, this is a loving process to instruct our children so that they know what's right and what's wrong because they're not going to stumble across it. They're not going to be tripping over the fifth commandment to honor their father and their mother. You need to tell them. And then when they go astray, you're going to need to discipline them because they need to know the fundamental principle that if you act or if you disobey the law, there's going to be neg negative consequences. They need to know that and it actually builds up a respect for authority. They learn authority in the home. That's why we're seeing today a just total wave of disregard for authority. It was actually vogue recently to, like, to not submit to authority. If you didn't submit to authority, you were cool. That's what's going around and that's what we need to be aware of. But in the home, the instruction and the discipline teaches children to respect authority, which ultimately should help them understand God's authority. God's authority, that's what we're aiming for. Because the last step that I've mentioned is correction. We can't just stop at discipline because what we don't want to do is produce children who are just broken, spirited, compliant children. We actually want to correct them with the gospel Use their error as an opportunity to show them that they've erred, that they've gone away from the commandment that you gave them, whatever it was, and that they've sinned against God and that they need redemption. They need forgiveness from God. It's an opportunity to actually teach them the gospel and to forgive them and to show them love. Whenever Holly makes a mistake, after she gets disciplined, I always get down on my knees to her level and I always give her a hug first thing. That's the first thing I do is give her a hug after the discipline and tell her that I love her. She needs to know that discipline is love and that they're not to be divided. And then I use the rest of the time while she's there in my arms to correct her, to talk about her attitude, to talk about why she did it. Where did that come from? Did she copy this? Did she copy that? Did she learn it from who? Whatever, we talk it through and then it's gospel time. But Jesus, remember what Jesus did, Holly, on the cross for our sins? 
It's an opportunity. So we instruct, we discipline, and we correct. And that'll teach our children to honor their father and their mother because they just won't do it naturally. Um, I learned this from my mum and dad. They taught me a little parable, if you want, their own little bit of wisdom. Uh, they, they said to me, Ben, children are like gardens. Children are like gardens. Weeds grow easily, and even the good plants need pruning. I'll say it again. Weeds grow easily, and even the good plants need pruning. And I'll leave that with you to remember, and you can you know, chew on it later, meditate on it. Next time you're gardening, you'll be in there. Weeds grow easily. Good plants need pruning. Oh, yeah. Children. Yep. Anyway, I'll leave that with you. But if we can do this for our children, instruct them, discipline them, correct them rightly, then this will actually lead them to have a long and a healthy life. And that's where we get to in the second half of this commandment. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. So that's the second half. So we're only halfway through at the moment. We're going to go through the other half. I'm just joking. Um, that your days may be long in the land. If your children actually obey that, then they will live long and live well. That's what that promise means. It's the first commandment with a promise. So it just makes sense, really. If your children were to listen to your instruction, let's take finance, for example. If they were to listen about how they ought to manage their money, or how they ought to engage in relationships, how they ought to eat nutritiously, how they ought to value education, how they ought to value honor, working hard, all these things, that if they were to actually listen to that, you would find that their life actually lives longer because they're not getting into trouble with the law or they're not getting into drugs or they're not speeding and end up in a car crash or they're not doing all these things. And so they actually live longer and they live better because you've brought them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord and you've shown them that wealth is not it, that prosperity is not it, that even if you just taught them the simple thing of contentment, contentment is significant if you want to actually live a happy life. To be content with what you have, to not seek more, is a wonderful thing to be able to teach a child. And they'll live longer and healthier lives. Now, of course, there is the exception. There is the freak accident, the car crash or the uh, natural disaster hits or something like that, but the exception proves the rule, doesn't it? The exception proves the rule. It's like in um, Proverbs 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. It's true in all the circumstances that you can think of, except for when, fill in the blank. And so if you want to live a long and a healthy life and you want your children, your grandchildren to do the same, then honor your father and your mother. God's given us a window into his wisdom. Honor your father and your mother, you'll live long. You'll live happy. But there's another dimension to this promise, the back end of this command that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. Another dimension, and I want to use this promise to now speak to any of us here who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Any of us here who have been searching for God or who have been wondering about Christianity or Jesus or whatever, I'm talking to you now, talking to you. This promise that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you is for Christians. It is only for Christians because its ultimate fulfillment will be found in the eternal land that God has for people who are in him through Christ Jesus. And let me explain. We need to remember that the Ten Commandments were given for a purpose. And that purpose is to show us God's holy standard. He requires perfect holiness from every single human being and the Ten Commandments show us what that means, what that looks like. And if we break any one of those commandments, then we've fallen short of God's standard, and the death penalty is what we actually owe, is what's due to us. Let's just take this one commandment, honor your father and your mother. If that's all the commandments that there were, I want to ask you this morning, have you ever dishonored your mother or your father? Have you always obeyed them? Have you always listened to them and always honored them? And I think 
the answer for all of us should be no, we haven't. We haven't. We've broken God's law. Now, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 4, that God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and that whoever reviles father or mother should be put to death. Pretty serious. If there was a disobedient child in the uh, ancient culture of Israel, and their father and their mother corrected them and kept disciplining them and kept going, kept going, that child would eventually have to need to be brought before a group of elders. And the elders would need to pronounce judgment upon this child, and the judgment would be stoned to death. The child needs to be stoned to death because they continue to refuse the instruction of their parents with discipline and all the rest. That's how serious it is in God's sight to dishonor your father and your mother because ultimately it shows that you dishonor God. You have no regard or respect for God's ordained institution of father, children, God, father, mother, children. So the death penalty is what we deserve. But the good news, of course, is that God sent Jesus Christ that God so loved the world that he didn't leave them without hope. He sent Jesus Christ into the world to live the perfect life. He always honored his mother and father and never did anything else wrong, yet he died. He died on the cross in our place, and it's by repenting of our sins, recognizing that we first sinned against God and trusting in Jesus Christ alone, that then we will be declared right in God's sight. He will see us as righteous and as like his son, no longer the sinner that we were. And so we'll be adopted by him and brought into his family. And we can call him Father. Father. Abba. This is the good news. That God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If you've never heard that message before, if you've never dealt that, dealt with your sin before God before, then I'm going to pray now, and this would be a perfect opportunity for you to do so, to repent of your sin, trust in Christ, be brought into the family of God as we close. Father God, I thank you so much that you have loved this world so, so much that even though your holiness, your justice required that we be punished with eternal separation from you in the lake of fire, that you then interposed and sent your son to take the punishment himself, to bear our sins on the cross, to die, to be buried, and then raised again in newness of life so that all those who would trust in him might also rise again in newness of life because they've been found right in your sight. And I pray that you would make this truth clear and understood to the hearts in this room right now who have yet to grasp that. Lord, I need, we need your spirit to move. For the Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. I cannot do this. I'm a frail human. I'm praying, Lord, that you might reveal yourself like you did to Paul on the Damascus Road to those who do not know you in this room now. And I pray that if that is the case, that they might repent of their sin and trust alone in Jesus Christ, calling on him as Lord and Savior for the redemption of their soul, seeing their utter need for him. And I pray that if they have done that, they might even have confidence to speak to someone about it and then to continue on in their walk with you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.